Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to worship with the Congregational Church of Brookfield. We want you to know that even though we aren't able to welcome you into our physical building, we welcome you into our church community and our fellowship. We like to say, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome with us. And that is true whether or not you're worshiping with us in person or through these virtual connections during this particular time in our nation's history, in our world history. As we're sheltering in place, we're doing our very best to try to remain electronically connected with one another. So we'd invite you to please email our church office at office at uccb.org if you want to let us know uh, your email address so that we can add you to our church-wide blast email list to receive weekly updates on our programs and ministries and to receive a weekly emailed link to our pre-recorded Sunday worship services as soon as they can be made ready to you. You can also check out our church website at www.uccb.org or our church Facebook page for other ways to be connected through our committees or our fellowship or study groups or various service activities and opportunities. One thing you'll notice about today's service is that we love to have many participants and voices helping to put together our worship. So please let us know if you want to contribute something, a piece of music or art, read scripture, offer a call to share, or a time with our children. We'd be happy to have you join us. We're recording on Saturdays, or you can uh, record something on your own and send it to us. We hope all of our church members will join us at 11.30 a.m. today for a quick congregational meeting on Zoom Live which we wanted to hold in order to get the congregation's permission to hold our formal annual meeting on Zoom live again next Sunday, May the 3rd. So if you need the link to that uh, Zoom meeting, please just email the church office at office at uccb.org and we can provide that for you. And now, according to our bylaws, I need to read the formal call to that meeting which is also posted on the front door of our church building and was mailed to our members who are not electronically connected. In accordance with Article 5, Section B of the Bylaws of the Congregational Church of Brookfield, a live Zoom congregational meeting has been called for Sunday, April 26 at 11.30 a.m. to vote on Church Council's motion of April 14, 2020, to modify our usual interpretation of the church bylaws to be able to legally hold an online annual meeting. If that motion passes, our annual meeting will be authorized for online voting as a live Zoom meeting next Sunday. So let me also read the call to that meeting. In accordance with Article 5, Section B of the bylaws of the Congregational Church of Brookfield, a live Zoom congregational meeting has been called for 11.30 a.m. Sunday, May 3rd, for the purposes of approving the deacon's report and role of active members, approving the 2020 to 21 CCB operating budget, approving a nominating slate of 2020 to 21 church officers and committee members, and finally, approving the allocation of 2,000 $519 from the Book of Remembrance Fund to reconfigure racks and supply venting for our media booth in order to prevent the overheating of equipment. And this call is signed Sue Washak, moderator, and Christy McPadden, church clerk. So one final note, we had planned to have uh, annual reports out to you via email uh, by this Sunday, but there was a slight delay. Our hope is to be able to send those out to you as a PDF file attached to an email on either Monday or Tuesday of this week so that you'll be ready to vote on next Sunday, assuming today's motion passes. 
will also uh, try to make a um, limited supply of paper copies available for you to pick up from a weather protected binder in the little red wagon outside the courtyard door to the church. So that was a lot, but we are so glad that you're joining us now for today's worship. Will you join with me in our call to worship? Let us praise the Lord who draws us up. O oh God, you lift up the soul. You restore to life all who seek you. Sing praises to the Lord, O oh, you faithful ones. We give thanks to God's holy name. Let all souls praise the Lord and not be silent. O oh Lord, our God, we will give thanks to you forever. Let us continue now with our unison prayer of approach and the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we confess that we too often forget to thank you when our lives are most happy and blessed. Remind us to share with you every day both our joys and our sorrows. Help us to remember that weeping may linger for the night but with you, joy comes in the morning. We know you have promised to be our helper, our healer, and our guide in all things. So grant us your gift of new life today and in the life to come. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs> Welcome for time with children, boys and girls. In today's gospel, oh, we hear a story about Jesus' disciples, how they go out onto the lake to go fishing. They fished all night and caught nothing. And the very next morning, there appeared a man on the shore and he said, hey, what'd you catch last night? And they caught nothing. So the mysterious man said, why don't you try fishing on the other side of the boat? And guess what happened? They caught fish? Not only did they catch fish, they caught so much fish that they had a hard time bringing it up onto the boat with their nets. And guess who that mysterious man was? Do you know? Do you know? Jesus. You are right, my friend. It was Jesus. It was Jesus' third appearance to his friends after Easter Sunday and his resurrection. And Peter was so excited to see uh, his friend Jesus that he jumped out of the boat, swam to shore to spend time with Jesus. And Jesus invited Peter and the other disciples to come ashore for breakfast together. And while they were eating breakfast, Jesus asked Peter an important question. He said, Peter, do you love me? And Peter looked at Jesus and he said, yes, I do, Master. Well, then Jesus said, feed my lambs. 
And a little while passed and Jesus asked Peter again, Peter, do you love me? Yes, of course I love you, Peter says to Jesus. And Jesus replied with, take care of my sheep. Well, wouldn't you know it? Jesus asked Peter a third time, Peter, do you love me? Well, Peter was a little upset at this point because, you know, he already asked me twice, he's thinking to himself. And he said, Lord, you know everything. Of course, you know, I love you. Well, then Jesus responded with, feed my sheep. So the big question for today is, why did Jesus ask Peter three times the same question, do you love me? So today we're going to suppose perhaps the reason is, or was, that saying it just isn't enough. Saying I love you just isn't enough. But we actually have to show we love someone. And we show by doing, by doing some actions. So that's our question for today. How can we show Jesus and how can we show the people around us in our lives that we love them? How do we show the people in our homes, at church, in our community that we love them? So especially now during shelter in place and we're spending a lot of time at home, how do we show others that we love them? So that's the question we're gonna start with tonight. So one thing I'm doing is I'm making masks and I'm posting them on Facebook and seeing who needs them. I've dropped them off in mailboxes around the neighborhood. Some people have come and picked them up. I've helped. Yes, and Luke has helped me. But what else can we do to show we love each other? It could be as simple as being kind, mm -hmm. saying you're sorry if there was an argument, helping with chores around the house maybe. That surely shows love reaching out to someone with zoom or skype or the Me phone messenger or a drive-by yes using messenger mm -hmm. uh, doing our schoolwork when we don't want to yes that could be a way we show uh love so that is your challenge this week boys and girls not just say that you love the Lord or say that you love the people in your life but show it by doing so let's end with a prayer can we pray together mm -hmm. today's prayer comes from a quote spoken by a pastor by the name of John Wesley dear Lord grant us the courage to do all the good we can by all the means we can in all the ways we can, in all the places we can, to all the people we can. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let us pray. Loving Lord, thank you for guiding us with your word. Open our ears to listen to your voice still speaking to us today. Open our eyes to see the present and alive everywhere we turn. Open our hearts to receive the bountiful new life you promised to all who follow you. Open our hands to offer real nurture and care to the world in your holy name. Amen. Our New Testament lesson is from the Gospel according to John, chapter 21, verses 1 through 19. Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, James, and John, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were able, they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. May God add a blessing to the reading of his holy word. Amen. Will you pray with me? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our minds and hearts as we worship you today, may it all be acceptable and even pleasing to you, for you are our strength and our salvation. Amen. Do you know anyone who really knows fishing? Somebody who really loves to fish? My uncle Jake was like that. He retired to a lake house just so that he could catch fish every day and eat fish for three meals a day if he wanted to.
my brother-in-law, Mike, also had his fishing buddies out in California, and they loved to charter a boat and go out into the Pacific when the salmon were running. And it was so wonderful for me and my family because Brother Mike did not like to eat fish. So we got a tremendous bounty from him every year. Now, I don't want to over romanticize fishing, you know, for the disciples, because they obviously had to fish for a living there on Lake Tiberius, better known to us as the Sea of Galilee. It was their full time job. And if they didn't catch anything, it was a real problem. They needed to eat. It was their living. But you can tell from today's scripture story that that beach on the lakeshore in Galilee must have also been a special place for Jesus and his friends to hang out together. It made sense that they went there to grieve and to regroup after the crucifixion and the resurrection when they didn't know what else to do. The other three gospels has John, um, has Jesus, you know, giving instructions about what the disciples should do next, but John doesn't say what they do or are supposed to do after receiving the Holy Spirit. Jesus just says, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. Unlike in Matthew and Mark, he doesn't send them to Galilee. And unlike in Luke, he doesn't tell them to stay in Jerusalem. He just sends them. But where? What direction? Fishing? I think it's interesting that in John, the disciples react to this mind-blowing miracle of Easter, having just seen him, even doubting Thomas, seeing him in person, by just going back to daily life. They see Jesus alive again, and then they go fishing. Go figure. Jesus had called them from the beginning you know, to be fishers of humanity. But this post-Easter fishing trip just looks like more, like it's just about the fish. So it made me wonder what Jesus thought about their decision. Personally, I think Jesus loved them and really wanted to hang out with them one more time in their favorite place. And I hear him kind of busting their chops when he showed up there on the beach. It makes sense that they see Jesus, but they don't recognize him right away because he's on the shore and they're out in a boat and it's just after dawn. They couldn't make out his face, maybe. So to them, he's just this one guy hollering at them from the shore. When Jesus says, children, you have no fish, have you? Well, that's the way our Bible translation puts it. It sounds very noble, very Jesus-y and holy. But the Greek sounds to me because because of the words they choose, more like, hey, kids, doesn't look like you're going to eat meat today, huh? I think Jesus was being one of the guys, you know, ragging on them for not catching anything. And maybe also because he was their teacher for not fishing for the right things in the first place. Not fishing for people, for example, to build up God's precious flock, but fishing for fish. And what I love is that Jesus seems to love them anyway, enough to stay and eat with them, stay for that delicious barbecue breakfast, roasting their fresh catch over a nice charcoal fire. What a wonderful reunion. But what does it mean for us today? What are we to take away? I mean, we're not actual fishermen. And why in the world is this fish barbecue story paired with the other part where Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? And tells him to tend my sheep. I mean, is this story about fish or lamb? It's kind of a mixed metaphor. Well, I think that question, fish or lamb, is kind of at the heart of the story. Jesus was a great storyteller. He used metaphors for a reason. And Peter and the disciples knew that. They would have picked up on it. So Jesus managed to meet them where they were that day on the Galilean lake. Nets empty, tired and discouraged after a long night of fishing. And he reminds them of a real life fish story. He gives one to them that they can tell their buddies later, you know, back in town. And the story is this. 
He says, you'll do okay if you listen to me, if you cast your nets off the right side of the boat. Remember that for them, the word right had a double meaning just as it does for us. It raises that metaphorical question. Are you doing the right thing today, buddy? You fishing the right way for the right things? There's also a lot of wordplay going on here between Peter and Jesus that we might miss. But any middle schooler who happened to know ancient Greek would pick up on that. That's because what gets translated as the word love in English is actually two different Greek words for love. There's this agape love that Jesus uses, the big Bible word for love, holy love. It's the word that Jesus uses on the last night of his life at the Last Supper when he calls the disciples to love God by washing their feet, loving one another. And then there's philios love, the, the word that Peter uses from that we get the word you know brotherly love like the city of philadelphia or a friendly affiliation in my greek translation that dialogue between um, jesus and peter comes out like this jesus asks simon son of john do you love me and peter replies yes lord you know i'm fond of you Fond of, what an old-fashioned word, but you see what I mean about middle school? You know those notes kids pass around when they have a crush on somebody? It would say something like, do you, uh, you know, love John, like John, or do not like John? Check one box. Also, did you notice that even though it was Jesus who renamed Simon with that new name, Peter, which means his rock on which he will build the church. In this story, he basically goes back to calling him Simon. I think that was kind of a burn too. So you see Jesus goes back to being the teacher here and the great Saint Peter is reduced to being little Simon in school again. You know, the first year student, a novice disciple who gets caught running away from his real job fishing for fish, but fishing for people, and then shepherding Jesus's flock. And the Q&A then goes kind of like this. Jesus asks Peter, using his full name, which any student knows, that if the teacher does that, you are really busted. You're in trouble. So Jesus says, Simon Johnson Peter, do you love me? And Peter replies, well, sure, boss. You know I love you. I like you. So he uses like, sure, I like you. So Jesus replies then, then feed my lambs. And Jesus repeats the question, Simon Johnson Fisher, do you love me? And Peter again, apparently doesn't hear the difference. He replies in exactly the same way. Sure, sure, you know I like you. But when Jesus asks him the third time, he says, Simon Johnson Fisher, do you like me? And this time, the Bible says Peter gets upset. And I think it's because Jesus finally repeated back to him that wimpy word, like. And Peter finally heard those, that word come out of his mouth. I'm sure it must have hit him hard as it did that night when he denied Jesus three times. I'm sure he was sorry to realize again how lukewarm his faith had been. I'm sure like us, he could remember his grade school commandment that he wasn't supposed to like God. But he's supposed to love God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength, and his neighbor as himself. So we can understand. We fall into that habit today. I often say, I love fish and I love chocolate, and I love my dear family, and I love the Lord. Those are not the same thing, though. We can identify with Peter when we get called out on our word use. We do love our delicious boatload of fish and other wonderful, bountiful gifts from God, but do we love them more than these? I mean, do we love God more than these things? It's a tough question. And one I think we're facing a lot these days in quarantine, 
as we face shortages of some of our favorite foods and toilet paper, not to mention how people are losing their livelihoods, their jobs, their savings. It's a time of scarcity and need. So when it's been a long night and our nets are feeling kind of empty, we start to look at things differently. I hope we start looking more into that dim dawn for Christ. Because I don't think at this time in world history, we're called to just be like those disciples and go about business as usual, just fish randomly tossing our nets here and there without purpose or direction. I think in this post-Easter world, we're called by Jesus to respond differently, especially to the needs of our hurting world. I say this as we prepare as a church to go from a share priority year into a welcome priority year with a real challenge before us. How do we welcome God's precious flock into our church when we can't open the doors to our building? I don't have an exact answer to that, but I have confidence in us that we will rise to that challenge as generations of the faithful have faced worse challenges before. I don't think we have to choose, you know, fish or lamb. One isn't bad and the other good. Jesus still cares for us, loves us enough to want us to fish and to feast with one another, to sit down in fellowship when we can with beloved friends and family, to break bread and share the wine. But also he calls us to focus outward on our call to love and serve Christ's flock, caring for the needs, especially of those lambs, those most vulnerable among us. And I think this story encourages us, like Peter and the other disciples, to look and listen for the risen Christ around us every day, not just on Easter, but on every new morning. I believe that if we keep looking and listening, the good news of Easter is that we will find Jesus again, arising for us in the light of dawn, offering us real guidance, helping us find the right direction for ourselves individually, but also for our church, and ultimately blessing us with the bountiful feast that we're called to share with all of God's precious flock around the world. Thanks be to God for this good news. Amen. So friends, as we come to our time of gathered prayer, we want to offer our thanks to those of you who made sure that we knew about your prayer concerns and your joys throughout this week, um, either by texting us, sending us a quick email or calling us, letting us know what's going on in your lives. We've been trying to check in with people um, either via phone or email or by sending notes. And um, we just wanna know that we um, are praying for you fervently and we want to be able to um, lift up the things that are most 
important to you at this time. So please do continue to um, send your prayer joys and concerns in our direction. You can do that either by mailing the emailing the church office at office at uccb.org, um, emailing myself or Pastor Bryn uh, at our emails, just our first names at uccb.org, or um, filling out that online prayer request that you can find um, on the homepage of our website. So um, know that as we come into our time of prayer, we are working on gathering all of your joys and concerns and thinking um, about the world as well as uh, those things that are closest and nearest and dearest to your hearts. And so as we do begin our time of prayer today, we of course want to continue our prayers for all of our leaders, uh, nation, state, world leaders for wisdom and guidance for everyone who are continuing to make tough decisions as we face this pandemic. Prayers for our healthcare workers, first responders, medical equipment suppliers, and researchers who are on the front lines of this worldwide battle. Um, in specific, for our congregation, our church family, we want to be in prayer for Emily and Cindy, for Ben, Diane, Maddie, Carolyn, Megan, Janet, Doug, Stuart, Pete, Kamala, Rob, Johnny, James, Jeff, and Oliver. We want to be in prayer for those who are hardest hit by the economic devastation from this COVID-19 crisis and for those working in social services um, and for all of our neighbors who have been so generous in making donations to things like the Brookfield Recovers Program, to Handy Dandy Handyman Ministries, to our Pastors Fund to help those who are most financially insecure at this time. We offer our prayers for all of our hardworking uh, teachers, parents, students who are doing online learning and living together uh, under one roof, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We continue our prayers for peace and patience, as well as gratitude for the chance to be together. And we pray special prayers today for those for whom say, home, home is not a safe place, but is rather a place of violence or hopelessness. And we continue our prayers for those around the world who were struggling before this pandemic hit um, and who will continue to struggle even after. Uh, those who are living in war zones for families separated from loved ones, whether refugees displaced from the Middle East or Central America, or our servicemen and women stationed far from home. As we look at our own church family, we are praying for all of those who are grieving or continuing to grieve the loss of loved ones. We pray especially today for Beth, whose friend Ohana died tragically this past week, for our colleague David, whose father David died on Saturday. And we pray especially for families grieving victims of the COVID-19 virus, uh, for Alex and Mary, who lost Aunt Sally this past week. Um, especially as the death toll increases every week, we lift up special prayers for those who are unable to say goodbye to loved ones in person or to gather family and friends in the usual ways for support during their time of grief. We continue to pray for all of those who have real worries about loved ones and frail health, especially those who are living or working in convalescent care facilities where they may have been exposed to the virus like Allison, Janet, and Keith and for Ed's mothers and sisters, for the families who are supporting frontline workers and for those awaiting test results or who have been unable to be tested. We pray for those who are sick and struggling to get well like Ralph, Candy and Raymond, for all caregivers and for those trying to support loved ones in hospice care at this time, especially from a distance like Renee and Shane. We pray for all of our members at home in self-quarantine or isolation that they can remain well and healthy. We pray for Bryce and Joe and Sophia along with others with disabilities who are particularly at risk because of underlying lung issues um, at this time. We continue our prayers for those who are struggling with other worries in their lives, whether those are worries about big decisions that need to be made or big transitions in their lives or um, recovery from other illnesses as well. We pray for those who suffer from mental illnesses or addictions. We're praying especially this week for Julia, who find that quarantine makes life even harder. For those who are missing and needing to cancel long-awaited celebrations, for those who are stranded in places other than home who have not been able to make their way back, uh, like Jeannie and Bob. And we pray for those recovering from recent surgeries or accidents, like Azat, for illnesses or um, who are trying to recover from illnesses or health challenges. 
We pray for those who are battling cancer as we have a long list of people um, either in our own congregation or connected to our congregation who um, are on that list of those who are battling cancer daily and who are needing to either postpone treatment or take the risk of going into a treatment facility at this time. And we pray uh, for Nick and Sherry as they continue to travel this week for Nick's cancer treatments in Texas. As we also think about um, life and all the things, the emotions, the feelings that we are having at this time, we realize that there are joys to be lifted up. And so we are praying prayers of joy today for our members and friends who are sick and have recently found healing. Joy for people who have been able to travel safely uh, and make it uh, back home perhaps, or to and from places for work with prayers for their continued health and safety. We are grateful for technology that allows us to carry to continue to carry on worship and other church business like the important meeting we will hold after worship today. We are grateful for the joy of the 50th anniversary of Earth Day and a bit of environmental healing that's taking place in this current time um, as we have not been on the road so much or not doing quite as much work. We realize the challenges that it brings, but we also know that um, God calls us to be good stewards of creation. And so we pray that we will find ways to balance that um, as we are perhaps able to move back into um, routines after this. We uh, lift up prayers for people like John, who celebrated a birthday this weekend, and Darl, who will celebrate a birthday on Monday, as well as others who are finding special and creative ways to celebrate new lives and birthdays and anniversaries during this time. And we are lifting up prayers of joy for all who are finding ways to use their gifts in service as we are separated from one another. For our caring angels helping run errands for people in need, for Jillian and her work moving our children's garden forward, for our merry band of mask makers and so many others. We so appreciate your care and dedication to our church, our community and the world in service. And friends, uh, just remember, please reach out to us. Let us know what's going on in your lives, what we should be holding in prayer for you in the days ahead. Um, and as we invite you to do so, I would also invite you into a time of prayer as we um, settle our minds, as we um, turn our hearts toward one another and toward God in our time of prayer today. God, who appears in the world in so many ways and through so many people, just as Jesus did to the disciples so long ago, we offer our gratitude today for the ways that we see you at work in the world. We thank you for showing up through the hands and hearts of those on the front line of this pandemic, the nurses, doctors, cleaning people, lab techs, grocery workers, and more who continue to serve with a sense of call that is stronger than fear. We thank you for the ways that you show up in the minds of the scientists working to find a cure, of leaders who are striving to make decisions to keep people as safe as possible. We thank you for showing up in the lives of people, first responders, the military, medical professionals, social workers who are reaching out to those individuals and communities who are most vulnerable and underserved in the midst of this crisis. We thank you for showing up in those who are finding ways to share their gifts to help our church family, our community, and our world, and to move forward with programs and ministries in hope. We thank you for your call to be the church in the world, and we ask that you would keep us open to the opportunities you do and will present in the days ahead to be your hands and feet and heart for others as we work to bring your kingdom about here on earth as it is in heaven. We realize too, God, that there are those among us who struggle to find words of gratitude and hope today. So we pray that you would surround them with your spirit of comfort, strength, healing, and peace. We pray for all those who are ill, those who are mourning, those who are struggling with issues we may never know or understand. Please help us to hear your voice still speaking to us about how we can be comfort and support, how we can be hope holders for others when they can't hold hope for themselves. We thank you that you are God, God who weeps with us when we weep and celebrates with us in the midst of the celebrations we have lifted up today as well. We thank you that you can hold all that we can bring to you, the joys, the concerns, the questions, the moments of doubt, the thanks and blessings. 
And God, we pray that you would help us to use the gifts you have given us to be agents of healing and positive change where we are able so that others might know your love and blessing through the words of our mouths and the actions of our bodies. As Jesus miraculously multiplied the fish for the disciples so long ago, God, multiply the good we can do in your name so that others will be pointed in your direction and may come to know you and all that you are able to offer through your love, grace, and strength. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Even in the midst of fear, in these times that can seem scary and hopeless, we see stories of blessing, of gifts offered to others, of generosity, of heart, spirit, and wallets so that others don't have to struggle so much. May we keep our eyes and ears and hearts attuned to such stories, and may we be a part of them, of experiencing them, writing them, and passing them on through the words of our mouths and the works of our hands, sharing generously of our time, talent, and treasures.
now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with loving kindness and grant you peace. And may God watch between and among us until we meet again. As we go forth into this week, let us pass the peace of Christ and extend God's extravagant love to all, family or friends, neighbors or strangers, in a written letter or a card, in an email or over the phone, through our electronics and social media, or even in person, but at a safe distance. Go in peace. Thank you.